amount of new finer grain data began to be available, not just for the richest countries in the world, but across all of the developing world. So this is a period in which Latino Barometro and Afro Barometer, to give just two important examples, came into being, giving information not just about fiscal flows, which is what the previous literature, that, such as what Adnan was talking about, was based on, but also political, social, cultural, and other variables, other data became available across many developing countries that permit us, permitting us to ask really difficult, nuanced questions that could not be answered before. So we take advantage of this evidence to take stock of the state of knowledge on decentralization in the world today across a, a broader range of countries with a special focus on governance and democracy building in developing countries. And one of the key aspects of this book is that because it's LSE Press, and we're very grateful to, to Patrick Dunleavy, Professor Dunleavy, the, the editor-in-chief, and to the LSE and the LSE Press for, for financing this, is that it's open access everywhere in the world all the time immediately to anyone who has a device that can download a PDF onto. So this book is freely available. You can download it now while you listen to, <clears throat> listen to me or maybe wait until the end of the, of the event. Um, it's available to the world, which, which is a huge thing for us because we want this book to be downloaded, read, and used, in particular in developing countries. We want to speak not just to other academics and to students, but also to policymakers, to government officials, politicians, civil society leaders, NGO and private sector leaders. We, we, we want the information to really filter down and hopefully make a difference. The chapters, so this is what we try to do in the book. It's taking stock, it's taking advantage of this new information and focusing on, on governance and democracy building. And the, the chapters include, and here I'm just going to show you briefly the, the table of contents. They include thematic critical surveys of recent advances in decentralization combined with cutting edge focused empirical studies of particular countries or particular collections of countries the authors are a combination of some of the most senior, most influential figures in the field that I'm privileged to share the stage with a couple of them and, and a number of others, combined often in teams on the same chapter with young, fast-rising, uh, brand-new PhDs, assistant professors, brand-new scholars who are using the latest methods and the latest data to really push the envelope of the field um, and explore complex issues that, that we really couldn't explore before. Um, and so the, the book is, is divided into this first part, which takes stock of 50 years of decentralization studies, what we knew up until Barden and Mukherjee, and then what we're adding to that with this book, and then a section on politics and a section on mechanism design, with both of which I'll come back to in, in just a moment. And so here's how the book operates. <clears throat> decentralization operates via to, down to provincial and local levels um, of administration and of politics, operates via a political mechanism and via more technocratic mechanism designs to do things like increase contestation and citizen participation. It operates through ethno-religious homogeneity, elite capture and clientelism in authoritarian and democratic regimes. On the mechanism design, more technocratic sorts of mechanisms, um, we deal with issues like corruption monitoring, information collection, and increased accountability. And we're looking at a suite of countries here that includes deep treatments of China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Brazil, Colombia, Ghana, India, Indonesia, and Kenya, as well as other studies that look at groups of countries or even cross-country studies. Um, oops, excuse me. Look, sorry. Looking, looking across uh, 100 or more countries using econometrics. So that's kind of the, the outline of the book the outline of the field that this book is, is coming out of and, and what we hope to contribute to it. Now let me spend a couple of minutes talking through just two or three big, actually three big ideas, three big themes that we deal with in the book. The, the, I'm not, it would be impossible to summarize a book of, of this length and this scholarship in a few minutes. So let me just pick two or three ideas that I think are important um, and to try to seed the discussion that, that will follow. And then my colleagues will go on and speak about their particular countries and, and, uh, and chapters in more detail. So the first thing is that decentralization is not a thing. No, no, what do I mean by that? Decentralization is not 
a policy reform that operates like a switch that you flip with monotonic results, monotonic outcomes anywhere that it's used. Decentralization, sincere decentralization, generates a heterogeneity of response that in any particular dimension, a dimension might be education or corruption um, or water and sanitation, generates heterogeneity in any one of those dimensions as great uh, where the outcomes are as different from one another as the underlying political economies are from each other. So let me say that a different way. When we decentralize, we should expect heterogeneous outcomes that are as varied as the towns, villages, districts, and provinces are different from one another in countries as diverse as Brazil, India, or Indonesia, just to pick three. This idea is tied to a wealth of conceptual and methodological insights that we're only really beginning to comprehend now. And, and this is one of the things we try to do in the book. For over 50 years, the question that scholars asked were of the form, is decentralization good or bad for X, where X is one of these policy dimensions that we care about. These studies approach decentralization as if it were a technocratic issue. They treat the specifics of reform, the many decisions about how to unpick centralized government and centralized provision of public services to decentralize which components, which authorities, which resources, to what level, and then how to organize that level of provision as if they were given, choosing instead to compare the effects of decentralization across countries. Now, this was always a methodological convenience because of the nature of, of the limitations of the data that scholars had, had to deal with before but it colored the empirical literature all the same, affecting the questions that were asked and how studies were structured. Only recently have we begun to internalize that the many decisions about how to decentralize, precisely which state functions, are not fundamentally technocratic issues. They're political issues everywhere all the time, including in autocratic or dictatorial regimes, which leads to the, the second theme, which is politics. So decisions to decentralize or not are taken by leaders that seek, seek political advantage, right? They're implemented or not by officials whose power and status are gonna be directly affected by reform. This is one of the major points that Devrajan and Kamani make in their chapter four in this book. Done correctly, decentralization can improve democratic accountability and the responsiveness of governments by changing the incentives that local officials face from upward pointing towards the center to downward pointing incentives towards local voters or local residents. This is one of the simplest but most powerful lessons of the last 50 years of decentralization scholarship. Decentralization ultimately affects not only local but also national public goods as well as the responsiveness and accountability of the entire state, not just the local localities or districts that are being decentralized too. So done correctly, decentralization should make local governments better attuned to local economic conditions and it should boost economic growth. But this done correctly hides a huge amount. It hides much more than it reveals. Because in reality, we see empirically, we see the countries decentralized in very different ways, devolving different sets of powers over different public services to different levels of subnational governments. So we have one level of difference of heterogeneity that I talked about before, which is how different countries are internally, one community in Brazil to another community in Brazil. On top of that, you have another level of heterogeneity, which is that countries do things in different, <clears throat> excuse me, in different ways, and they do things in different ways because of politics, because the incentives are different and because different politicians have the upper hand in designing or implementing a reform which leads to different outcomes. This leads Devarajan and Kamani to the striking conclusion that in the real world, most decentralizations are partial. Not only are they not full expressions of some underlying blueprint, which in reality doesn't exist, they're not even full expressions of the diverse blueprints that countries announce or even pass into law, because between the announcing and passing a law of decentralization, for example, and its implementation, there are lots of different politicians that have a hand with different incentives that end up changing what actually happens. Most decentralizations are incomplete in the sense that economic theory would predict and often feature large mismatches between devolved responsibilities and accountability. But these partial decentralizations nonetheless represent political equilibria very often 
that balance competing forces in a polity, it can make it very difficult to make marginal changes to that decentralization. But I don't want to be negative, I don't want to sound negative, because politics also provides strong grounds for hope. <clears throat> Increased contestation in local elections that typically follows on from decentralization, even in some of the most autocratic dictatorial regimes on the planet, like China, for example, which has 700,000 elected local governments with free elections. Yes, yeah, so think about this. We, China is, is not an electoral democracy by any stretch, and yet it has 700,000 locally elected governments. So the increased contestation, which is one of the things that I learned in this book, by the way, because it's in the chapter by, um, by, by Gerard Padro and colleagues. So increased contestation in local elections can lead to improved service delivery in localities and in the summation of those localities in the country at large because decentralization often leads to more and better people getting involved in local politics, it can improve the level of administration and the level of, of, um, uh, of allocation of resources. It can also help shine a brighter light on local governance and bring more information about what's going on in, in the state into the public realm. Um, and so this just leads to greater accountability. Lastly, and I'll close with this because uh, before Andan stops me, the, the third big idea is mechanism design. There's a great deal to successful governance beyond politics. Effective decentralization implies adapting structures, rules, norms, and behaviors to new actors and dynamics that a centralized system probably didn't have before. This is what we refer to as mechanism design. So chapter two lays out in detail which powers to decentralize to which levels of government. That's kind of the summation of the public economics literature that Adnan mentioned in his introduction, and how to design tax and transfer systems to fund all of that adequately. Chapter three by Dilip Mukherjee, one of the, the editors of the previous book that we referred to, then looks at everything that has happened since then and brings us right up to date to the present day, considering recent policy innovations to improve monitoring and supervision that have really changed the game in fundamental ways across dozens of countries in the world. So for example, many, many of you will have heard about the Indian program that uses biometric identification cards to verify employment beneficiaries. This reduced program leakages to ghosts, that is to, to fake or inexistent or dead beneficiaries that should not have been receiving benefits. It reduced these leakages by 41%. The real deserving beneficiaries were paid more quickly and then reported earnings, their earned income as opposed to their benefits, increased by 24% and all of this at no extra cost to the treasury. So it's like magic. It's like an extraordinary change that has massive differences. It makes a massive difference to Indians, especially to poor Indians. In other countries, non-elite citizens are hired as monitors to beat down elite capture of public benefits. Program management has been successfully contracted out to NGOs or even to public sector firms. In a third set of countries, there are formula-bound programs that reduce the authority of locally, locally elected officials. Dilip Mukherjee takes various components that are really being implemented, that are, the, that are having success in different countries in the world, and he thinks in a blue skies way, can we combine these things uh, programmatically and he suggests a big data approach that might use survey data to predict the level of poverty of each individual in a country, including in a country like India with 1.4 billion individuals. So we could predict, you could use this data to predict the poverty of each individual and then distribute benefits to them nationwide in terms of desert, in terms of poverty and need, via this nationwide ID system with biometric identification combined with electronic transfers to very low-cost bank accounts or even mobile phone banking. Such a system could improve pro-poor targeting significantly at very low cost while reducing losses and distortions due to capture, corruption, and inefficiencies. But what I really want to underline here is that what, what is intellectually particularly interesting and, and kind of a, an intellectual challenge in this, not just the, the, the administrative challenges of making something like this work, is that it's a technocratic alternative to decentralized politics. 
So the chapters in the previous section that I talked about were looking at making politics work better for more transparency and more accountability. Now we're talking about mechanism design and technocratic um, mechanisms that might lead to greater efficiency and the poor getting more benefits um, that sort of make an end run around politics. And the real challenge is combining political mechanisms with technocratic mechanisms in a coherent system of decentralization. So let me sum up. I, I fear I'm, I'm going over my time. Let me sum up what are a couple of the, 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 the big takeaway points. Decentralization is not in itself a good or a bad thing. Right? It can be designed strategically to take advantage of the political and mechanism design insights offered in this book. And the book goes into much, much greater detail than, than I'm able to tell you now to promote democracy, efficiency, and accountability. We can say that with confidence because the chapters in the book document many cases of it. Secondly, first order theorizing is really not useful in this field. Decentralization is complicated, it's nuanced, it's multidimensional. Reformers faced a daunting set of choices as they design and execute, execute real decentralization programs. These details are not trivial. They're crucial if decentralization is gonna fit the challenges that developing countries face. Getting it right is difficult, but it's immensely valuable because it can improve the quality of a country's governance. How do we get it right? We get it right by combining these political with technocratic measures in ways that work with the grain of national and subnational incentives to target resources and hold officials to account. The chapters in this book shine a light on how to do this. They shine a light on how it has been done successfully in many cases, unsuccessfully in others, in countries that span the range of a huge range of diversity. They answer questions about why it works, when it works, and how. Um, and why and how it doesn't work. Um, lastly, consider the climate of geopolitical discontent and unrest that we see around the world today. Democracy seems to be stumbling everywhere. Making democracy more robust, including via decentralization, to make it more effective has never been more important. So thank you very much, and I'll hand on to the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much and a very warm welcome to this event. And before I start, I must first um, thank LSE Press for their unwavering support throughout this book, which made our job so much easier. Everybody, I, I'm not mentioning any particular name, but everybody has been super helpful. So I am Shurmishta Pal. I'm from the University of Surrey, and I am one of the editors and contributor for one of the chapters. So what I'll do, JP has provided a bird eye view of the book and I'll now focus on my chapter, chapter seven of the book, which is in the politics section of the book. So let me just. Yeah, just go straight ahead. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's my presentation. So uh, what this chapter does, this is a joint chapter with Onirban Mitro from University of Kent, and this is the title of the chapter. As the title suggests, what we do in this chapter is to look at how fiscal decentralization can affect local politics, which is not so obvious. Obviously, we know that when fiscal decentralization happens, it affects the budgetary allocations and the spending patterns. But how it affects local politics remains less obvious and little understood. And what we do in this chapter is to look at the case of Indonesia uh, that had um, a major decentralization program being introduced in 2001, soon after the Asian crisis in 1998. And we look at the Indonesian case and try to understand how it affects local politics. So here is a schematic diagram. So what you see here is that when I mean local politics, what we really look at, what we really consider in this paper is how it affects the uh, process of leader selection in the community. So communities in Indonesia are the lowest level of administrative units and what it, uh, how these communities decided uh, the leaders, how the leaders were selected, the process of leader selection. And depending on the data availability, what we see that there are two 
process of leader selection. In some cases, we find that leaders were selected by uh, discussion and deliberation, consensus building, which we call a participatory democracy, where uh, there was um, everybody was participating and building consensus. The other type is the more common one, is the electoral democracies, where leader was selected by voting, majority voting. Obviously, how the leader is selected is quite important for us to understand because you know, the, whether the leader is selected by a few or by the majority will determine how the leader serves the community, how the public goods are provided. So what we do here is uh, distinguishing between these two types of democracies and see what really leads to the choice between these two types of um, democracies after fiscal decentralization. And what we find that uh, the nature of ethnic homo homogeneity or ethnic diversity played a very important role. And that really leads us to uh, form a couple of hypotheses. One is that if the community is homogeneous, by which I mean that if the uh, largest population group is very large, and there aren't many other types of population group, those communities share common language, common culture, common preference for public goods, and those communities actually may find it easier to uh, discuss and deliberate to find uh, some consensus, and those are the communities they are more likely to choose uh, participatory democracies or consensus building. While the ethnically diverse communities, they, you know, their cost of deliberation and discussion uh, is much higher than the homogeneous communities, and they would go for voting in these communities. And uh, the other good point about voting, particularly after decentralization, is that uh, what happened after decentralization, you know, there is a greater rent from holding an office in a community. So that might attract more um, political entrepreneurs into the office. And it creates a kind of political competition. And that might lead to the selection of the most uh, productive political entrepreneurs into the office who might be able to boost local income and local development. And we also envisage that it would be uh, better uh, only when the in inequality is lower, because if the inequality is lower, elite capture can be uh, kept at a minimum. And in those communities, uh, if there are political entrepreneurs who can boost local income and local development, uh, they can actually try to align drivers' economic interests. So that's really the main hypothesis. And then we try to look at the data. Uh, we use Indonesian Family Life Survey data, two rounds, 1997 and 2007, which were, and the decentralization happened in 2001. So the two years separated by the introduction of decentralization. And the communities that we look at could be rural or it could be urban. And we really uh, see whether we get some confirmation of our results. And we really do get the confirmation. So we find that ethnically homogeneous communities are more likely to choose a consensus building uh, after FD, while ethnically heterogeneous communities do find uh, do go for more majority voting. And we also find that uh, voting communities actually performed much better. So here we measure local entrepre political entrepreneurship by local income and local development. We have a whole range of measures there. And we really show that the voting communities did much better in terms of uh, local income, local development, um, and then the corresponding consensus building communities. And uh, we also try to provide some mechanisms how this is possible. So the main mechanism that we identify here is that um, uh, the leader turnover is much higher in the voting communities than in the consensus building communities. And that creates the more accountability, greater accountability. And we also show that the income inequality is relatively lower in these consensus, uh, sorry, in these voting communities. So 
uh, that's the, these are the main findings. I would just close by uh, a, few, a couple of reflections on these results. So we believe, we try to argue um, that you know, these results have wider uh, implications beyond the Indonesian border. Uh, in, in particular, we see that um, in Europe particularly, we see there is a greater perceived threat as uh, immigration is growing. You know, it's not only, you know, we have seen in different parts of Europe, but we have seen, we have, re we have experienced right in the uh, UK that, uh, you know, what, what led to the Brexit referendum results that um, uh, there is a growing public apprehension from the perceived threat from uh, growing immigration, and that has really resulted in this uh, Brexit, among other things. That's not the only reason, but it's partly responsible. And in you know, in the forthcoming LSE blog, we really try to show that you know the anti-immigration policies are not really helping much, and there is uh, because immigration levels becoming higher and higher, and we try to argue that the effort should be more on uh, integrating the immigrants rather than uh, anti-immigration policies and car cartelling uh, immigration because that does not work. On the other hand, in a very different country, India, what we see that there has been growing incidents of communal conflict uh, along religious lines, and what we see that uh, for what we try to argue that decentralized governance could be kind of a kind of a, could give some respite to these increasing conflicts uh, because you know one of our results that shows that if the even the diverse communities if there is political entrepreneurship that can actually align the diverse uh, population groups and could reduce conflict so uh, we uh, i would uh, i would conclude just like um, jp did is that the dysfunctional uh, decentralized uh, systems are really uh, causing a lot of problems uh, with the democratic systems ag around the world. We have seen it in terms of this geopolitical conflict as well as environmental conflict. And so uh, we need better governed decentralized systems to address some of these issues. Thank you very much. Um. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to this symposium to, to launch this book. OK, uh, what I'm going to uh, present briefly is a study that is in the book about the decentralization in Colombia, uh, particularly what is called the administrative decentralization as it, and its impact on Educational expenditure and student outcomes, again from Colombia, with two with two quarters that are there. So let me explain a little bit about Colombia. Colombia uh, is a good example of decentralization. I'm going to show you why later, and we show that decentralization improves the provision of public goods and also improves efficiency in the use of the public goods. That's what we want to show in this, in this, in this um, article. So how can we show that? I mean, it's very, when, when we talk about the, the decentralization, it's very difficult to, how, as, the, as, the, as the author said, to separate what causes decentralization to work, because the decentralization is a bundle. It has many things. He has a political decentralization, has a fiscal decentralization, has administrative decentralization. That's one thing. And the other thing is that there are different levels of decentralization. Let's say the regional level of decentralization, the local level of, the, of decentralization. And to know empirically why so, so, so something where in, in decentralization is, is really very difficult because it's very is is uh, econometrically or quantitatively is very difficult to know what is working or what is not working. This is a real challenge, and unfortunately, the Colombian case allows us to disentangle 
what's happening with, with, with decentralization. Uh, in a particular way, what, what happened? In Colombia, in 1999, there was, as it says there, a profound economic crisis. Uh, the GDP fell and the fiscal deficit increased by a lot. So, and the, there was a great deal of discussion why that happened. And people were saying that because there were many transfers to the regional and local governments, that was part of the problem. That, that, that transfer that keep growing since the beginning of the, of, of the 1990, growing and growing. And people were saying that that growth in transfer that the central government gives to either the regional governments or to the local governments, that was the source of the, of the crisis. So, to, so that, that was pointed out at the, at the, at the, at the root. So there was a, then there was a change in the decentralization rules, as, or as, uh, as the, 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 the author was saying, in the mechanism, in the, in the mechanism design. And the president and, and the minister went to the Congress and said, OK, we have to change the way transfers from the central government either to the regional governments and to the local governments are, are done, because this is going to cause a, even a greater explosion in the, in, the, in, the, in the public finances. So they passed on laws. They, they passed on changes in the Constitution to reduce the growth of transfers. And they established a, a rule, you know, the transfer just going to grow 2% per year and so on and so forth. That's one thing. But the other thing that they do, that, that, that they did at, at, at the moment, was to fix a rule. And the rule was very simple. The, the rule was very simple. They, 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 they say, and we try to find why they did that, but they say, OK, in this law, we are going to decide that some municipalities are going to be autonomous in spending. So they are going to decide how they are going to allocate the transfers that, they, that, the, sort, that the central government is, is giving to them. And some, some municipalities are not going to be autonomous. So who are going to decide for, non, for those non-autonomous municipalities? The, region, the regional government, what is called in Colombia, the departmental government. The, Departments are the, like the provinces, and then are, are the municipalities. And, and they say, OK, how are we going to set the rule? And they say, this, this, has, this has got, are, are going to be the, in the following way. After 2001, the, 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 the law was passed in 1999, and said, OK, let's wait a couple of years. And after 2001, we are going to be Total autonomy, total autonomy to municipalities that had projected population, not even the, the real population, but the projected population, because the census was in, in, in 1993. So for, by, by 2001, we only have projected populations. If the, if, the, if the population in a particular municipality is greater than 1,000 people, we are going to give Total autonomy, and for and for municipalities that were lower than 1,000 people, we are not, we are going to reduce autonomy, and most of the most of the decisions about the spending are, were going to be taken by the provincial government, not by the not by the local government. So we have what we call a perfect experiment. So that's what we love in economics. Having these experiments, you know, because this is a experiment, if you are greater than 1,000 people, you are going to have a total autonomy. If you are less, you are, you are not to have autonomy at all, or just a little autonomy. So this is a, a perfect experiment, because we we are able to, to, to know with that experiment that change just one rule administrative decentralization. Who is 
managing the resources. There was no change in political, uh, in political decentralization. There was no change in fiscal decentralization. Only that, only administrative decentralization. And so the, this is, that things occur very re rarely that we have that perfect experiment uh, in, 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 in economics. So to, to do things quick, how does it work? So we, fortunately, we have this amazing database in, in Colombia, and we found the following after doing all these studies. We first see here, you, 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 you can see, I don't know if I'm unable to, to, to point out, in the, in the left graph, we see two lines, one, one uh, um, point, point line, which is how much transfer we're given to the non-autonomous municipalities per student. We, we did this, 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 this study for, for, for education. What happened in the education sector with this change? So what we see is that the transfer per students given to non-autonomous non municipalities the, whose resources were going to be managed by the departments or by the provincial level were higher than the transfer that were given to the autonomous municipalities. So, so like, like in, the, in, the, in, the, in the game of how, how much transfers were given, the nominal autonomous municipalities won. So that's one thing. But what but we find is that even with low with lower transfers given to the municipalities that were autonomous, we found that the enrollment rate of students increased. So so with, with less money they were able to to increase enrollment rates in, 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 in education above the non autonomous municipalities. That's what was what the first thing. The second thing is that we also find that autonomous municipalities ha has had so far better educational outcomes. So we found that 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 um, children and, and youngsters do better in tests in those municipalities. So we try to see why that was happening. And the one thing that we saw is that when the municipalities are, are able to manage themselves the resources, they are there to allocate those resources more according to the needs of the municipal of the of the of the of the, of the, of the children. So we found that those municipalities were able to hire better teachers, like the the the, 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 the teachers were more educated with, with better tests in the, in the, in the, in the entering enter, enter exam to be a teacher. We saw that they built schools in, this, in the places in where no one is in, in, which, in which school were needed. So, so what we see is that decentralization works in the sense that when you give some autonomy to the municipalities, those municipalities are able to allocate resources better. So, and this is a particular experiment that, that is very difficult to, to find anywhere because, those, because when there is a decentralization reform, it makes everything, it makes fiscal and political decentralization. Here we have just a particular change, and, and, and the change in this particular case was very positive. For the for the for for the educational sector and for uh, and for the children and and justice of Colombia. Thank you. Thank you to my fantastic panel. They were great. This was also a perfect experiment on my chairing skills. Uh, I didn't pass <laughs> the timekeeping skills. Uh, so in the interest of time, uh, I'll be I will overcompensate now. So I have a very quick question to each of you, and I only need 30 seconds, no full sentences, just bullet answers. <laughs> and then we'll open up to Be ready with your question and people online also. So JP, on the basis of this work, how would you update your earlier work, which asked the question, is decentralization good for development? And so let me start, like, let me ask all the questions then, so that you can. Uh, 
if decentralization is political has winners and losers how would you convince the elite in a country to go for the decision to decentralize and to fabio um, if the impact of decentralization does not just depend on the willingness but also the ability to do it properly what capabilities are critical for decentralization to work okay quick yes thank you sir i i would update my my previous beliefs and claims by acknowledging that decentralization is far more complicated even than i thought then that the role of politics in the design of decentralization as opposed to the way that 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 a local government plays out once the decentralization is in place is critical and those things need to be taken into account from an incentive point of view from from exanti that's what i would say perfect and just a very quick answer so if decentralization really increases political competition so elites can also get some rent from uh, you know holding office so you know so if the elites perform better everybody can have a higher share of uh, the rent uh, from decentralization great and in an in an autonom autonomous municipality what we need to have success is that the politicians there are able to negotiate with the other politicians to allocate resources better this is the uh, the, the the bargaining skills are really important for that perfect so you see we professors can can operate under time constraints <laughs> <laughs> occasionally <laughs> okay so over to you so we have some questions from the online audience um, let me go to for one question meanwhile you can prepare your question i there's a question from karen portland um, how can regions decentralize that may involve several governments or regional zone such as forestry management in the usa and uh, northwest usa and canada should an international organization like the un climate agency coordinate this local input and regional planning for the whole area with local based solutions supported by community input supported by funding services they need so multi tier government international yeah, aspect that's really common everywhere right you know when it comes to the local forest management for example i have been working on brazil in this respect and i see and there is a coordination problem that comes up there you know for different la layers of government particularly if different layers of government is um, uh, is run by different parties political parties so there can be a coordination problem a uh, funding issue i i agree with uh, it, you know there should be very uh, clear transparent funding rules which is not always the case and particularly there are these conflicts across different levels of government but i believe that the local forest management would be done better if uh, it is really at the lowest level of government because it's happening there you know where it is happening and the people can really choose in their very best interest rather than something being imposed from above tp fabio do you want to add anything let's go on to the next one we okay, talked okay. so much already yeah okay let's get questions from the audience so the gentleman in the first row and then the lady in the second and then the gentleman are, are there mics yeah, yeah there are mics great uh so my name is james and i'm a lsc master student uh my question is uh what is the advantage of technocratic governance in the field of decentralization studies over and above uh political interventions especially with reference to say mechanism design in 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 the sort of the technocratic sphere of like uh, interventions that you can make uh, yeah. okay so think of let's gather three questions okay. uh, and uh can you please pass on to the lady at your the next uh i thought there was a lady here also so um i had a question on how should the central government react when the population says oh we're really struggling with the local when it once given autonomy uh we don't see any results and we would rather push back that uh, transfer of power to the central government because it's so new to the local governments to practice in in the fields that they're working in um so how how have you found any way uh to kind of limit the political um narrative from going into okay let's pull back the power okay thanks so can you please pass on the mic to me 
Um, my name is Omer, and my question is specifically for Mr. Jean Poo. You said that um, decentralization will often have a majority of a positive impact. Would there ever be a situation where it can have a negative impact rather than a positive overall, essentially? Okay, so three great questions. So mechanism design interventions, how do we resist recentralization by the central, and on the negative impact. So you can choose whichever question you want to. Uh, yeah, it's let, 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 the technocratic. Let me kick off on, on mechanism design because I think I introduced that, but then I'll pass it. Because I'm sure Samus has something to say about that. So, in, in the era of big tech, talking about mechanism design, circumventing or undercutting politics makes me extremely nervous. <laughs> no. um, but nonetheless, what the evidence is showing is that taking as a given that the decentralization will be done in different ways in different countries, the politics may constrain the sorts of methods that we might normally expect to generate accountability and efficiency. So in, given that context in a particular country at a particular time, you might solve some of these problems via an application of mechanism design that is technocratic. That is not to say there's a blueprint and I'm saying get rid of politics by no stretch whatsoever. But in a, in a particular situation where there's a particular problem, mechanism design might offer an end run around the problem that solves it at least for a time until the political blockage might, might be resolved later on. Do you yeah. I, I'd just add that, you know, the, we just have to balance the technocratic uh, mechanism with the political mechanism very carefully because there is the risk that Dilip Mukherjee discusses in his chapter that, you know, there can be a risk of recentralization because if it is technocratic mechanism, you know, that's ruled by a few formula and, you know, it's being held, being controlled by the central government, then there is a, a chance for recentralization, you know, and the power will be again captured by the central government. So whenever we introduce a reform, you know, where the technocrats really take over, we really need to make sure that that doesn't happen, that elected local governments still should have the final say. I, I have a, there, there was a question about when, when, when there is pressure to pull back the transition and, and that, at least in the in, in, in the Colombian case, that has happened a lot, you know, because like like I mean, there, there is there are many scandals of corruption in the in the local politicians, and so and but I think that that, that I mean my what what I what I can see with with with, with the experience is that after this internalization, even with all these corruption scandals, even with the with the thing that you know the politicians steal money and so on. This decision has done a lot for social improvement than central management of the of the of the of the resources. So when when it doesn't worry be because there is not a, a good match between political decentralization and administrative decentralization. So, so so when 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 it doesn't worry because something is not is not matching. It's not because decentralization is wrong. By 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 Excel. This is my, my, my answer to that particular question. I would just like to add to your question is that you know that we actually talk about some constraints. You know, chapter ten and eleven of the book really talk about some local constraints in the local government. You know, sometimes um, there there isn't a, a properly skilled personnel or, you know, the data management, you know, there are some of these constraints. There is a very interesting ch chapter on Bangladesh where we really, t the, the authors there really talk about the introduction of uh, birth certificates, which is really crucial for the delivery of a lot of public services which are related to the age of the individuals. And there they talk, you know, they did some field survey, primary field survey, and they found that uh, despite the best efforts of the government, you know, in some districts it's more successful than in other districts, and it's really down to the personnel who are dealing with it. So that's the other issue that may come up here, you know. So what the chapter really argues that there needs to be enough support provided to this local government for, uh, you know, data generation, data maintenance, so that the public services can be delivered to the best possible way, in the best possible way. Can, can, can I add something to, to that? I mean, I, my, my, I don't think that, that I mean, what, what matters is the incentive that, 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 that the politicians have, I mean, to, 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 uh, 
to be accountable to, to the people. I mean, that's what, is, that what matters. I mean, I think that the, thing, the, 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 um, the, the, the preparation of the people, you know, the education of the, of the, of the, of the local politicians or the, or, 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 the, or the local providers is important, but not as important as the incentive. I mean, I mean you can have co communities in which the people are not very well educated, but still they answer to people because they have the right incentives to do it. So uh, for, for me, it's just incentives to to be accountable more than education of the of the of the of the of the uh, of the officials of in the in the government. That's that's my particular view. Let, let me answer the, the last question on negative impacts. So the, there are very many cases of decentralization that, that had negative impacts across the world where the decentralization programs failed and produced bad outcomes. Um, I, I try to highlight the positive ones because those are the ones that I want to take lessons from. But you know, you're absolutely right. I, I don't want to be misunderstood as saying that it always works well. It does not, and in very many cases, it's failed. So, if I simplify enormously and heroically, there are three broad principles of good decentralization. One is when the services are devolved to the right level. So, for example, monetary policy stays with the central government rubbish collection gets devolved all the way down to the lowest level of government, and other services like education and health go somewhere in between, as according to the, the economic and political characteristics of the service and also the characteristics of the nation. That's one. Two, is that enough money is devolved or fundraising authority to fund those services? And three, accountability and transparency such that decision makers can be held to account. So when does it go wrong? When a country or when a program violates at least one of those, it tends to go wrong. You get unfunded mandates, you get poor quality services, you get spiraling corruption, and this has happened all over the place. So the book is, is geared towards giving us lessons and ideas about how to avoid those pitfalls. Great, this also takes account of the next online question of example where decentralization hasn't delivered. Okay, so let's go for at least one more round if people have quick questions. So let's go from the back, the lady at the back and the gentleman there, and then we'll come uh, maybe over there then. Uh, the lady at the very, very back. Uh, I'm trying to project if I'm audible. Uh, there's a mic also coming your way. Um, thank you. Um, so my question is uh, uh, for JP and maybe Adnan, you may want to pitch in. My name is Aisha. I'm from Pakistan and I'm an MPP student. Unfortunately, locally in our country, we consider our decentralization maybe not the most ideal model. But I'm really curious about what lessons have emerged from your study because Pakistan was on the list. Um, you know, and we have unfortunately a context where uh, neo-patrimonial forces are at play and political elites capture the decentralized uh, institutions as well, and in situations like this, where does one begin with the right balance of the technocratic and the political? What do you reform, and where are some of those windows of opportunities that countries like Pakistan can um, capture from? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, there, was a, there was a question here. Yes. Uh, can you please pass on the mic to the gentleman? Thank you, good evening. My name is uh, Sahachini David. Uh, a question regarding, uh, so in the context of developing countries specifically, how can we address a central government's concerns that decentralization can stimulate secessionist tendencies, especially in multi-ethnic regions? Um, and how can we therefore avoid the vicious cycle of mistrust from the constituent states within our regions uh, and a, re a, a reinforcement of secessionism as a result? Okay, great. And there was a question here. Uh, maybe to the gentleman. Yeah, please give it. Uh, oh, so the mic is on that side. Hello. Hi. Uh, good evening to all the professors. Thank you so much for this uh, session. My name is Shreyan Singh. I'm from India. And I have a, like a two-part question. So uh, I wanted to understand the federal aspect to it, like in countries like India, US, where there's a federal state, uh, like a state government and a central government. The, comp the, the idea of decentralization becomes a, another layer gets added to it and it becomes a more, lot more con complex, especially in states like India, where the states are ethnically divided 
in terms of the language and the culture and everything. So I wanted to know the uh, federal aspect on that. And second is a more uh, uh, detailed question in the sense that there are a lot of um, parts of the budget, like let's say the defense, which are specifically taken care of by the central government. And now when, when we, let's say, a place like uh, a, a place where, let's say, there's a border dispute between two countries and uh, the decentralization system is there. So in that case, um, like the budgetary requirements would be different, the defense requirements for that area would be very different. And in that sense, the central government always steps in and needs to step in that, in that case. So what are the, so these are some pitfalls that can happen. So how does uh, decentralization cope with, with challenges such as these which require central government to inevitably step in? Okay, so three great questions, one on Pakistan, the other on secession uh, ethnic, and the third on federal, uh, both the special case, India, and challenge of operate decentralization in a federal context. Let, let me kick off, if, if I may, on, on the Pakistan one, because the question was about the chapter, but I, I'm going to pull you in on this, because <laughs> I, I tremble to say anything on Pakistan when I'm sitting next to Adnan Khan. Um, so, <laughs> The, the, the chapter in the book um, by, by Jean-Philippe Plateau and, and two co-authors really focuses on the, the political system and how it, is, it has developed in what, what, what everyone thinks, everyone who studies decentralization thinks is an absolutely fascinating case in Pakistan. Because against all expectation, Pakistan typically decentralizes when a military government takes over and then re-centralizes when it returns to democracy, which is bizarre given the priors that most of us have about the conditions under which decentralization is likely to happen, with results that are then also go against the, 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 the expectations that we would have. Um, and the, what Plateau and co-authors point out is that, or their contention, and I'd like to know your view on this, is that Pakistan, early in its independence, was was developing a programmatic style of politics based on ideological principles where you had left versus right parties, liberal and conservative, or whatever, whatever terms you might like, um, that, that were gelling around programmatic considerations, meaning ideological considerations. And the first, um, the, the first dictatorial government broke that and resorted to a combination of religious appeals to making a coalition with, with the religious establishment in Pakistan and also to the, the big important families, in particular the landowning families, and broke that party system and then reverted to a, a kind of a, um, a different kind of politics which has endured to this day and that explained then when the, the return to, de, to, to democracy happened it was a different kind of democracy, not organized around programmatic politics. So that, that's what the book says. But yeah. Adnan, let me give you a very 20-second yeah. response and then move on to the next. Yeah, there's a lot of sympathy for this argument. I think uh, in Pakistan, the primary question of whether to have a democracy, an elected or unelected government, uh, is still unresolved. And that affects everything, all the decisions of decentralization. Our previous work uh, is called... Um, the counter-cyclical pattern of democracy, local and national democracy in Pakistan, what you referred when we have, when Pakistan had periods of national democracy, uh, there was no local democracy, and then uh, when there were unelected periods, um, they used basically decentralization as a legitimizing tool. So unless exactly. it breaks out of that trap, uh, this, this cycle continues. So. Yeah, so it's deeply political. So. Yeah, but let so me the, the, this away. chapter really talks about this chapter by Plato and others really talks about this was legitimizing dynastic politics and which has done real harm to the political competition and in the rise of democracy in uh, Pakistan. Yeah. So my, my question I'm really keen is to how do we go beyond it? It's like, are there any windows of opportunities from other countries that people from my country can maybe capitalize on? I can give a 10 second response uh, <laughs> because there's not much to say beyond 10 seconds. <laughs> on this one. It's a so the puzzle question. is not unelected governments going for local democracy because they're using it for legitimizing purposes. The puzzle was the elected governments not going for local democracy and decentralization because 
they saw them as rivals for sources of patronage. And unless the democratic forces, political parties change their stance, uh, uh, that's the best hope for, for getting democracy established, uh, at least in my view. But let me hand over uh, yeah. the other two questions, the session. Just quickly, the question on India. Uh, you were talking about defense. Defense is hardly um, under the control of the decentralized government. So decentralized governments mainly deal with the provision of the local public goods, mainly health, education, community welfare. So defense and uh, you know some atomic energy and some other priority sectors are always controlled by the central government. So um, that won't be dealt with by the decentralized local government. So you know, to avoid all the complications that you raise, yeah. Okay. Okay, and the question of uh, multi-ethnic countries and the threat of uh, risk of secession. If, if I can take a stab at that, um, this is a, an issue that interests me. Um, very often it's claimed that we cannot decentralize because we're in a heterogeneous multi-ethnic country and then some region will break away. Um, I, I understand where that argument is coming from and there's a certain amount of logic to it, but I think the argument is false for the following reason. Around any secessionist group, any secessionist movement, there will be a hard core of people who want to break away, usually organized around leaders who want to run their own country because they're from a group that's too small to run the entire nation, so if they break away, the state can become a country and they'll be the president or prime minister, etc. But around that hard core are organized like layers in an onion, other levels of people with softer support for secession who want more manageable or, or easier to, to, to satisfy demands around, um, around uh, ethnic revindication, around the use of their language in school, on television, radio, etc., especially in multi-ethnic countries where one group has been oppressing others or, or has not fully recognized the rights and privileges of others, what, what they want can be satisfied precisely by decentralization. You can peel off layers of support around the radicals by satisfying them with things like local control of cultural spaces, use of lo teaching in local languages. So why should a group that speaks one language be forced to learn the language of the dominant group where in their region people don't speak that language very much? But that's what happens very often in big diverse developing countries. And I give you two examples where it has succeeded from Europe. So devolution has, has largely succeeded in quelling the threat of succession in Northern Ireland and in Catalonia, where these groups wanted independence, and it's not really on the agenda, neither country is about to break up, precisely because of devolution in the Northern Ireland Assembly and because of the, the Spanish asymmetric devolution that gives Catalonia a great deal of power and resources. Great. Uh, sorry for apology for going over time. So, but if the audience is willing, we let's go for a final round of questions and then close. Okay. So, the lady very enthusiastic. And then, uh, yes, uh, hi everyone, my name is Amira. I'm a PhD student uh, at the University of Oxford. Uh, my question is that uh, one of the consequences of decentralization is um, bigger gaps and inequality among the regions. Um, I mean, I can speak specifically for Indonesia in which regions with um, can have uh, better quality leaders, other regions do not, and maybe also different types of um, capacities in the regions uh, as well as other potentials. And so what is the approach um, to, to solve this inequality, especially from the central government perspective when um, there are less controls and less authority in actually uh, driving this locally elected local governments? Okay, Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring lecture. Uh, my name is Matthew, I'm a member of the public. Uh, simply, um, in this country, the provinces, Scotland and Wales, their politics has been perfectly ghastly. And I wondered if they could learn from this prudence and this wisdom that you learned from, including also the, the northern part of England. Okay, any final, final questions? Or yes, the gentleman. Um, so, uh, hello, uh, my name is Gokul. I'm a MSc student from India. Um, so my question is two-pronged. Uh, so the first part of my question deals with democratic fatigue, where uh, you ask people to go for election after election, especially 
when you get down to the division of powers, people aren't particularly aware of what, of who controls what, and therefore they're not particularly willing to go for elections, especially in regions in which there is no, um, uh, there is no local community participation. I think you can see this in India, where in Kerala and West Bengal have higher rates of local ele uh, electoral participation, while the other states of India you don't find a lot of uh, the turnout at elections are pretty low when it comes to local uh, level elections. So how do you uh, deal with this question of democratic fatigue and the lack of democratic education in the populace? Okay, and uh, the lady, final, final question, sir. <laughs> Hi, thank you. My name is Marva, I'm a master's student. Uh, just maybe just to sum this up, um, your, the, the word democracy is in the title of your book and I just wanted to ask you, um, to what extent is democracy necessary or Im implicated in the process of decentralization? Thank you. So, four great questions. <laughs> Regional inequalities, lessons for UK, uh, how does decentralization work with democratic deficits, like the example from India, and uh, the question about democracy itself. <laughs> and your chance for final remarks also, and uh, let's also close it. Uh, yeah, so the, the democratic def the deficit is re it's a real problem and you know, it has to be uh, addressed by local activism and, uh, you know, our, uh, an awareness campaign, you know, that, that can really to some extent sort it out. But if people are so unaware of the things, but, you know, to, to a large extent, this is really a problem of inequality and poverty, you know, people have such subsistence living, you know, in some localities where people are not bothered about uh, conscious voting and, you know, conscious uh, pa democratic participation. And um, I know that there are, in some areas of India, there are some activism, you know, to, uh, you know, there are some NGOs that really try to uh, make these awareness campaigns, you know, to inform people, you know, the information campaigns that can really uh, help and uh, raise some awareness. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a problem in some parts of the um, world, you know, in some parts of the country, and it's not the same always, but uh, the hope is that, you know, people learn from each other, you know, if there is something good happening in one village, the other neighboring village might learn from the neighbor, from their neighbors, so uh, yeah, it's learning by doing basically. Yeah, so there is no easy solution. Okay, thanks. No, uh, about the uh, about the the, the and, uh, and and regional gaps. I think th this is a very important question because most of the decentralization designs uh, give more money to to the to the poorer regions. So 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 there is a Thing that say, okay, since this region is poorer, so the central government gives more money to that, to that, to that region, and with those uh, funds, those, that that region is, is able to provide more public services and so on. And at the end, we we, we expect that there is going, that is that is that there is going to be a converge a convergence between between regions. That's what is that is, that's what was thought. But what happened is what. But the study that I know. Show that that's not the case. I mean, if you give more money to to a, a poor municipality or, or to a poor province, so the people that that are there have less preparation to spend the, the resources wisely and so on. So at the end, the impact of the decentralization on convergence is really really small, as, as far as I know. So 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 the the question how how can we do this decision in terms of of incentivizing a converging between regions? And I think that my particular view is that that's not a function of decentralization. Decentralization is not to 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 uh, to incentivize converging between regions. I think that that is a thing of the central government. I mean, how to invest more more money in those regions? How to increase uh, um, human capital in those regions and so on? But I think that decentralization is very, does very poorly, in my opinion. I don't see to uh, to uh, to 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 increase 
convergence. That's okay. that my, my Thanks, so, JP, final word. <laughs> okay. Um, so, very quickly through each of them, regional inequalities, um, we can deal with this in a decentralized system through horizontal and vertical transfers, which we talk about in, in Chapter 2 in, in some detail. And this is a decentralized solution to the problem of extant inequalities. Um, secondly, on, on Scotland and Wales, the, the, the devolution system that we have in this country today came out of the late 1990s and, and the Blair government. Um, it, it, it's, it's very particularly suited or sort of shaped by the, the politics of that time and has sort of been frozen since then. Um, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not British, I, I don't vote in this country, so I have no say in the matter. Um, but it's not logical to me that, that Wales should have devolved government and the north of England shouldn't, for example. It seems to me that if you have a well-ordered devolution, then it needs to be throughout the entire country, not just in, in particular bits. So I do think, in answer to your question, there are a number of lessons that can be learned to go further and, and to have a, a, a more coherent decentralization framework in the UK, lessons that can be learned from many of the other countries that have done it. Um, but, but while recognizing this is a country with a very, very long history of centralization, you know, I mean, it's deeply woven into the body politic of the UK. Um, thirdly, democratic fatigue, what you see in countries that decentralize is a huge upsurge in democratic enthusiasm. So decentralization is, can be, often acts as an antidote to democratic fatigue. There can be, demo, democratic fatigue tends to be born out of the sense that democracy is failing me and my community and my needs. And when countries decentralize, in Bolivia, for example, decentralized in 1994, the, the number of people voting, the, the turnout rate increased by more than 100% nationwide. It more than doubled as a proportion of the adult voting age population. This is not fatigue, this is enthusiasm. No, and you see that kind of thing happening again and again and again. Um, although it, it does, it, it, it it does tend to happen in countries that have a, a well-organized decentralization along the lines of, of some of the points I was trying to make. Um, and the last question, I'm going to flip it and, and say, is, is decentralization necessary to democracy? And I think the answer is yes, because what is the alternative? The alternative is that the central government tells localities and communities you cannot be trusted to organize services and functions that really only affect you like primary education, trash collection, local roads, et cetera, that don't affect the rest of the country. You can't be trusted to do that, so we're going to do it for you. That, to me, is just anti-democratic. Great, perfect. So I, I hope you agree. I'll just add one more yes, thing, you know, just to add to what JP was saying. We just end with a sense of optimism. The study by Stuti Kemani and... Uh, Shantar Dev Devarajan, you know, they have shown that even in India there has been increased contestation at the local level, there has been better quality of leaders coming up. So there has been some positive developments after decentralization, although acknowledging the fact that, you know, it has not been uh, balanced across the country. It's a huge country with uh, so many different kinds of uh, governments. Yeah, thank you. So, perfect. So, let me, this was a fascinating discussion. We could have continued. Uh, let me thank the panel. Fantastic work. Like, uh, let me thank the audience, uh, both in person but also online. And finally, let me also thank uh, LSE Plus for coming up with a series of books. You know, the classic answer to how do you get a good book was back, borrow, and steal. And now the LSE Plus has added a D word to it. Now you can download it as well. <laughs> So thank you very much, Patrick, and, and, and fantastic colleagues from LSE Plus. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.